so we're in DC. There are lawmakers and regulators here. So let's start with the talk centering around creating laws targeting proof of work Bitcoin mines across the country, which it's essentially synonymous now that Ethereum has had its transition. So I want to begin with this idea of what we saw in New York. So in November, there was a new law passed that targeted certain Bitcoin mining operations that run on carbon-based power sources. And, and Fred, I toss this first question to you, and then I will widen it out to the, the panel. But I feel like this has to do, like my question is more about who these rules are targeting. So right now the attention is on a tax on proof of work mines. So the people who are buying the energy rather than creating more of an energy excise tax. So you're looking at where the power sources begin. And I wonder if you can kind of walk me through this dynamic of how lawmakers are thinking about how to create rules around this industry. Yeah, it's an interesting topic because especially in New York, the utilities can choose who they want to sell electricity to. So you could have just as easily told the utilities don't sell any electricity to crypto miners. But what they specifically said was don't allow a crypto miner to turn back on a fossil fuel plant that had been shut off. You could still mine using renewables and you could still mine just taking electricity off the grid if you could get a permit to do it. But it was very much targeting specifically proof-of-work miners uh, with a fossil fuel energy generation source. So it was, seemed very illogical. They already had the tools to control it if they wanted to. And they chose to do that kind of to send a message specifically. Any other thoughts on how New York went about regulating around this industry? No, I, I would agree with what Fred said. I, and I think it's a little bit misplaced because I, I think there's a lack of understanding in how our industry actually supports new energy generation rather than being a, a burden on the system, that it's, it's actually a benefit. We see the energy consumption as a feature, not a flaw. Yeah, and I think we're definitely going to unpack uh, a lot of what you just brought up. One other question on the regulation front, though. You know, there is this narrative out there that in the last few weeks, it's exacerbated operation choke point. And so I think about this in the context of the on and off ramps to between U.S. dollars, so your, you know, your fiat currencies, and Bitcoin. So we've seen that as dovetail with the series of bank failures that took out a lot of liquidity from the market. Now that's not mining, but it is part of this larger narrative that there is a push by regulators to make it more difficult for crypto-based operations to operate in the US. And I, I just wonder, my, my question is, this has been a narrative for a while, but it's become, like a year ago at this time, it was not nearly as intense it is, as it is now. And do you feel as though there's more hostility in terms of the rules and regulations that are being discussed or either uh, passed into law at this point? I mean, on, on my end, I mean, we're a Canadian company, so, so for us, it's really, um, we've been very close to coming into the United States at several different occasions. We're still looking at different opportunities, uh, but we need that stability. We seek out stable jurisdictions, and, and, and we need to feel comfortable uh, with where we're going to be putting our investments. And, and right now, uh, we're operating in Sweden, Iceland, and Canada, and we would love to um, also grow into the U.S. I think the big challenge for... The, the Bitcoin mining industry specifically is, you know, we're not dealing with consumers. We aren't doing things anyway related to the trading of Bitcoin, these FTX scandals, Celsius, etc. We mine Bitcoin. We operate data centers, we consume energy, and we secure the Bitcoin blockchain. And yet we get bundled into this kind of uh, regulatory morass where instead of having clear rules, they, the FDIC and Treasury Department simply tell banks, you know, if you have crypto clients, we're going to raise the bar on how we evaluate you. And so all the banks all of a sudden say, we don't want crypto clients. When Signature got shut down and um, the FDIC clearly said, no, no, we're not targeting crypto customers. Yet the person who bought the assets of Signature specifically said no crypto assets. So, yeah, they're definitely targeting crypto companies. Are, is this affecting the way that you think about your business and whether, you know, the mines need to be offshored and, and kind of, you know, upend your U.S. business a bit? Well, it's, you know, we announced recently a joint venture in the UAE uh, to build the largest uh, data center in the Middle East, 250 megawatts. We're clearly looking at offshore as an opportunity not just to find more stranded energy, but we clearly feel that the industry is being targeted in the U.S. and we need to diversify. So I would, I, I would agree with that as well. I think 
um, watching the trailer for the video um, two segments ago, there was an interesting comment that said, banking doesn't have a crypto problem, but crypto has a banking problem in light of what's gone on here. And I think that, you know, with the, the public response to what Bitcoin represents and how it's fulfilling what it was designed to do in light of all this uncertainty surrounding banking is kind of a testament to it as well. So we were hopeful and optimistic that forums like this will push forward appropriate re legislation because once we have a clearly defined set of rules, I think it'll, it'll differentiate us. You know, there, there was a debate as to whether or not Bitcoin mining companies had an obligation to report on the end use or the end buyer of the Bitcoin. We don't have access to that data, so we would all instantly be deficient on those reporting requirements. So I think that the, the, the U.S. will be a safe haven for it, but I think it's going to require more outreach and work to make sure that we're educating people about it, what it exactly it is we do and how we benefit the, the, the communities in which we operate. Yeah, I think that idea of education around what the Bitcoin mining industry can offer other sectors. I mean, let's look at energy in the United States. Like a lot of the fundamentals of proof of work mining are fundamentally misunderstood. There's not, uh, you know, this this nuanced conversation happening around how proof of work mining can actually help incentivize the build out of you know, uh, infrastructure needed to harness the power from renewable energy. We're seeing that going on in West Texas, among other places. There's also this dynamic that was just being discussed in the previous panel around how Bitcoin mines can serve as um, a way to help stabilize power grids. Oil and gas majors have very aggressive ESG targets, again, uh, using, you know, having Bitcoin mines on site to mind, uh, you know, otherwise uh, gas would be flared. It, it, these, these, my point is just that there are all of these ways that it is very constructive, and I want to unpack those. So let's start on stranded renewables in West Texas and how Bitcoin mining is actually creating this financial incentive to build out uh, so, infrastructure. So if you look in West Texas, um, energy markets need two things. They need generation, they need transmission. You can have all the generation in the world, but if you don't have transmission, you can't get that power to the consumers. That's the challenge in West Texas. You have all this renewable energy, wind energy, solar energy, amazing amounts of energy. The problem is the transmission to get it from the underpopulated West Texas to where all the population is in Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, et cetera, is lacking. And so you have energy that's stranded. There's this concept called the duck curve, which is basically how energy is consumed during the day, and it looks like the shape of a duck. The tail is the morning, it starts, you turn on your heating, your cook, then the middle of the day, you don't consume a lot of power, and then you come home at four o'clock in the afternoon, you turn on the air conditioning, or you turn on the heating, you're cooking, and that's peak demand, four to 9 p.m. Well, solar energy is created primarily from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., right in the middle of the duck curve. And if you look at how energy is consumed in the stack, you have nuclear energy at the bottom, then comes coal, then comes gas, which you can regulate up and down, and last of all is solar and wind. If you want to build out renewable energy in this country, you have to find a way to consume that solar and wind energy, because there's no economic incentive for an energy generator to build a solar plant if they can't sell the energy. And in Texas, 20% of, of the time, it's negatively priced energy. They basically have to pay you to take the energy. So the only way to do that is have a baseload customer like Bitcoin miners who can site their equipment at the point of energy generation, no need for transit, transmission. You can consume the energy, and when the grid needs it, you just shut off your systems, just like the prior panel said. And then when they don't need it, it comes right back up, and you're mining Bitcoin again. The energy generator earns revenue, which helps subsidize and finance the cost of building out more, which makes the price of that energy to the consumer lower. And I think that is something that people don't, you, know, you, th you think adding more renewables to a grid is automatically a good thing, but it also requires a lot more logistical hoops to jump through, i.e. that baseload needing somebody who can toggle their power use on and off to balance out when it's not windy or it's not sunny. How, how has this played out for you guys with your operations? Well, we, we've seen it much the same. So CleanSpark kind of evolved out of the energy space. We built decentralized distributed energy resource management systems, commonly called microgrids. And we would incorporate renewable energy with storage and distribution. And the challenge to do this at scale is to, over, or to, to build storage that will accommodate the generation when it's created 
and then distribute, distribute that later when it makes sense is problematic because um, energy storage systems are expensive, they degrade over time, and then they become a disposal issue. Bitcoin is really the perfect solution to that in that you can overbuild generation, we can take the surplus capacity, acting as that balance in the load, and as Fred mentioned, instantaneously curtail when there's demand elsewhere. So it really is in partnership with the grid to further expand and add renewables without the risk of having to add an, a component of energy storage that creates problems later. Now we've seen this narrative play out in terms of being um, Bitcoin mines being an advocate to the grid in terms of helping to build stability. That, that narrative has really played out quite well in, in Texas, and I know the previous session just spoke to that. Where else are you seeing this, this relationship between lawmakers, between the grid, really work quite well with Bitcoin miners? Um, I think states like North Dakota, Montana, um, who really understand it, you know, unfortunately it's right in the middle of the country. <laughs> um, you know, part of the problem in New York, for example, is transmission again. You've got hydro in the north, but all the consumption's in the south, so you have a lot of north-south. You have renewables on the east, but there's very little east-west transmission capacity. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem in New York. The eastern part of the U.S. has this transmission issue, and transmission's hard to build. Uh, it's $2 million a mile, and nobody wants high-power tension cables running over their property. So it's really hard to do it. So West Texas is a great area. Um, South Dakota, Nebraska, um, North Dakota, uh, parts of Oklahoma. You know, there's some great areas in the middle of the country, Montana, uh, to do this. You've got good wind, you've got great solar capacity, land is cheap and ample, but it's, again, stranded energy. If you're going to build energy generation there, there are no consumers. And so you need a baseload customer like Bitcoin miners to soak up that energy. Yeah. We, we have a big presence in Georgia, and Georgia has... Um, abundant nuclear power. I mean, our industry, Bitcoin mining as a whole, runs on more than 55% renewable energy. So in Georgia, we take advantage of the overbuilt capacity and we actually partner with the cities. So the way that works is in these small rural communities where we have a lot of operations, a big portion of the energy that we buy, we buy from the city. Um, so the city buys it from distribution and then they become our utility. So the city makes profit on every kilowatt hour we buy, benefiting the towns, but more importantly, there's sales tax on all that power that we buy. So we literally add hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in sales tax revenue that benefits schools and parks that enables the, the citizens of the state of Georgia or in any jurisdiction that you would operate to benefit from the investment they made in these renewable resources decades ago. So we, we actually see opportunities where there is surplus capacity to kind of be that shock absorber and, and support that going forward. I think that the dynamic of nuclear co-locating with Bitcoin mines and, and toggling with uh, you know, other renewables, whether it's wind or solar, is fascinating. So you mentioned Georgia, there's an operation up in Pennsylvania. Is this the next, not frontier, it's already going on, but is this where you're gonna see a lot more focus going forward? Well, I think clearly the crisis in the Ukraine has revitalized nuclear as a viable energy source. Um, you have SMR, small modular nuclear reactors, which are essentially, traditional nuclear is you build a one-off power plant somewhere. It has to be custom designed, all the parts have to be custom built, it has to be licensed. SMRs are assembly line nuclear reactors, it's similar to what you would find on a nuclear submarine. So 30 megawatts, fairly small. Best of all, they use the fuel that traditional nuclear reactors give up as spent fuel. So they're consuming this waste nuclear uh, product, if you would. But they're perfect because they don't need water cooling. They can be put in the middle of a community if you wanted to. And the first ones of these will be licensed either in 2027 or 2029 in Wyoming, I think it is. Um, but you know, there's a lot of investment going into these because they'll be relatively inexpensive because they're not one-offs. Um, they'll be able to be cookie cutter, so licensing is going to be much easier. So I'm super excited about that. It's certainly an energy source. We think it's going to be very viable. And uh, nuclear as a green energy, if you would, mm -hmm. um, is really viable. It's just a question of there's this public stigma about it. Yeah, there is. I mean, California exiting entirely from any sort of nuclear power generators. So do you, do you get around that stigma? It is a clean power source. Um, so... This country, 
you know, everybody wants electric vehicles. Uh, the problem with electric vehicles is they need energy. And so think about Route 80 that goes east-west, a lot of cornfields. There's no power generation there. If you're going to have a Tesla semi-truck pull up to a supercharger to get charged, that needs 30 megawatts of power. Where are you going to find 30 megawatts of power? You're going to put solar farms around these charging stations? So this country needs to build out a huge amount of electrical infrastructure. California is banning gas heating, gas cooking for electric. Well, California doesn't have enough electricity as it is. So this country's got a problem that needs to be solved. Nuclear is one solution to it, more renewables than other, but we need to fix how energy is stored and distributed. And in the meanwhile, Bitcoin mining fulfills a really important purpose, which is we consume that energy while that infrastructure is being built out. In terms of scaling operations, when I think of renewables, I think of behind the meter operations, and then I think about things that are on grid. What do you lean toward? Like, what are the benefits or, you know, the, the, some of the disadvantages of going behind the meter when you operate? So behind the meter, and most of our operations are behind the meter. So that, what that means is you sit at the power plant before the electricity leaves the generator and goes to the grid. You're consuming it at the point of power generation. So um, other, I won't get into the legal and utility rule-ish benefits to it, but essentially um, you at that point aren't connected to the transmission medium, so you're not creating more grid congestion by having to take the energy from the generator onto the grid, then take it off the grid. Any energy that goes onto the grid is being transported to consumers. You're just using the excess energy at point of generation. So you're not contributing to grid congestion um, in that way. So that's our preference, but... So, oh, so we have... I, I was just gonna comment that, you know, that having had the energy background and working in the demand response space, that, that's absolutely true. And, and we, we believe that that's a viable component of what we do, but we also feel like the economic value in being part of the grid and being a consumer for that subsequent distribution kind of enables, eases that transmission mm -hmm. congestion as well. And, mm -hmm. and just to touch on that demand response side, I mean, part of what we do is operate and build data centers, at least for, for Hive. Uh, but another thing that we do is we're a service provider to the grid, uh, to the utilities. Uh, really, we are viewed in the jurisdictions that we operate in as providing demand response as a service and frequency response as a service. So there are different types of demand response that you could offer, different programs that you could sign up for and onboard um, to with the utility. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of them are paid. They really view us as a critical part of their infrastructure. And in a lot of cases, uh, almost all cases for us, we are invited uh, to the jurisdictions where we are operating, and we are tied in uh, very closely with the utility, the community, and all the other stakeholders. So Gabriel, when you talk about the hospitality that you've had in sure. um, your target market, so we're talking about Sweden, Iceland, Canada, and, yep. and, and have you thought about expanding into the US, or is it just that there, when you have other places that are inviting you in, it just makes it easier to do business? Yeah, so definitely the invite is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, we were very close to coming into the US uh, last year, uh, and then some of the news uh, with the kind of change in policy with ERCOT uh, gave us cold feet. We said we would, okay, step back from this, take another look, uh, and see how this develops. But we're, we're still looking for those opportunities. Um, I mean, Hive in particular is focused on stranded uh, surplus renewable power. So our focus is on hydro and geothermal. And, and hydro for us, I mean, one of the things that we were talking about with, um, with, with peak uh, and base load and, and balancing the grid, uh, another fact that is very interesting is that we actually um, save the utilities. On top of making utilities a lot of money by monetizing an underused resource, which is basically water flowing around a dam rather than actually through the turbine, uh, we actually save them a lot of money because in these jurisdictions where uh, they're relying predominantly on hydropower, to hit that peak that they need to hit, they need to hit it quickly. And in a lot of cases, they're using uh, combustion and non-renewable power to be able to supply that power to the community. So with what we're doing in Bowdoin, Sweden, we are bringing up that baseload um, to the point uh, where um, basically whenever there is a peak, it's diverted from us. And we are integrated uh, with uh, the grid operator, uh, so that is completely automatic, and we are paid for those services.
I'm also fascinated by the utility that I'm seeing in um, some operations that are actually using Bitcoin mines to heat entire cities. One place in Canada is doing that. I was speaking to some Bitcoin miners in Lebanon uh, who actually turned to crypto mining just because there's capital controls that make it impossible to access your cash. It's very difficult to earn money. And, and he's in the process of building out a, a similar infrastructure where he lives. Does anyone want to speak more to like these ancillary benefits? So we're, we're doing that right now. I mean, in Quebec, uh, we have a 40,000 square foot data center and we are heating a 200,000 square foot facility that's right next door. Uh, they're a spa and jacuzzi manufacturer called Trevi. Mm -hmm. And we save them about $300,000 a year in heating. So we're already doing that in Sweden. We have a project that's underway. We're going to be heating a greenhouse. We're going to bring cucumbers, tomatoes, and a fish farm uh, into northern Sweden. Uh, so first of all, we're, we're just reusing the byproduct of our operation, and the byproduct of our operation is hot air. Uh, that's it. We're using renewable sources. All we generate is Bitcoin and hot air. So um, our, our you know, company DNA and ESG Focus is leading us to kind of push forward in these types of initiatives. Um, and, and then the secondary consequence of that is that there won't be shipping of cucumbers and tomatoes all the way from Spain to northern Sweden. So it's, it's really just a benefit. And, and I see that uh, over the next, well, very near term, there's going to be a lot more integration uh, into, um, you know, public uh, infrastructure. For example, we're in talks to uh, put a special uh, heating solution for a, a hockey arena. Um, there's uh, a, you know, a lot of calls that we're getting uh, to heat um, uh, different types of industrial parks. And for example, this is where it's really important to kind of very, be very thoughtful in your regulation. Uh, in Quebec, uh, where we are operating, um, new regulation has come in which says that basically there's a moratorium on, on, on any type of new crypto, uh, power consumption for crypto. And, and on top of that, there's also a mandatory curtailment. So companies like ours are very happy to curtail as part of our DNA. It's how we kind of integrate with the utilities, but certain mandatory curtailments that don't take uh, individual factors into consideration uh, lead to kind of the death of really interesting projects. How are we supposed to heat a greenhouse if the curtailment is abusive, mandatory, and takes down the operations 95%? You know, it's just impossible to innovate uh, with that type of regulation. So industry consultation is just so important in this new and ever-changing uh, space. I want to ask one more question on demand response because there are a lot of people who feel that um, questions of what is proprietary tech, like who owns patents and, and the IP that is involved, there are legal battles going on around demand response. What is the vibe on the ground in Texas? So we, we're operating primarily in Georgia and in New York, so we have an option for 500 megawatts in Texas. And it just so happens that our partner um, on that agreement happens to be one of the companies that holds that patent. Um, we, from, from our perspective, see that it disincentivizes um, opportunities to be creative and, and leverage that. So the, the, the question or the concern, the debate is, is it software that makes a decision or is it a human, you know, does, does a person make the decision and then how do you communicate it, how do you protect it? So I, and I this is this is the tech where I should have like teed this up a bit better. Uh, essentially, where you know you can turn Bitcoin miners off and on depending on what the demand is on the grid. Well, this technology is like highly, highly precise. You can do it real quick, and you can do it to varying degrees based upon the exact uh, demand that you're trying to counteract. Correct. Um, we we do a similar version of that at our at our proprietary mining facilities, and we have models. It, it calculates in real time the the price of energy per kilowatt hour, the, the the global difficulty of Bitcoin, you know what the hash price is and what the price of Bitcoin is. So we can make a decision if if it makes sense to overclock or in some instances to underclock or to curtail. But right now that there's a human component to that. It's not software enabled. And I think until somebody challenges that patent and we see kind of what the outcome. Um, of those of, of that litigation is, you know, I think there's going to be a degree of uncertainty. Um, but but until then, I think there are ways around that to be you know to have that human interaction in the middle of it. And ever since the Alice decision in the Supreme Court, any software automation of a manual process 
is already now essentially you can overturn those patents. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, we'll likely see if somebody decides to contest it, um, they will likely be overturned. Now, during the last bear market, I'm thinking around 2016 to 2020, it took a while for Bitcoin mining companies to run out of cash. Uh, so it, you know, the, the bankruptcies didn't come nearly as quickly as they did during this most recent bear market. And it's been tough, you know, and like Bitcoin's on a tear the last 10 days, but we're still talking about trading in the 20K range versus 60K range. And my question to you is, who's getting rolled up to who? Like, who's buying who? What does the M&A space look like in the next six months, the next year for Bitcoin mining companies? We, we've been pretty active um, in the bear market. We, uh, we grew from January to January. We grew about 230%. Um, some of that was building out our facilities, deploying resources that we had been acquiring in the spot markets, but others, uh, other growth was through acquis acquisition. We bought a couple of facilities in Georgia. Um, and, and what we found is that it's really about scale. It's about implementing all those efficiencies and the models that we talked about, and then continuing to maintain that efficiency. So I, I, I believe that especially with the, the having a year from now in May of next year, you're going to see a greater degree of consolidation for those mining companies that have a fleet that's less efficient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's measured. Our, our processing power is, is called hash rate. So um, a computer that the ASICs, obviously, they, they, they process power and there's a ratio. How many joules of energy or how many watts, essentially, per terahash? And globally, that number is about 47 watts per terahash. Domestically, it's closer to 40. Um, the more efficient miners are in the you know, 30 to 22 watts per terahash range. And so I think part of the M&A cycle and part of the consolidation and growth will be more efficient miners rotating out of the less efficient parts of their fleet and continuing to focus on growth organically, which I think will ultimately lead to the less efficient miners um, having a lot of infrastructure come for sale when they can't compete. I think that there's going to be a sunset on those less efficient rigs like what we're seeing now. I don't, I don't think any of us have um, rigs that are in that 45 watts per terahash range. It's just not economically viable anymore. Yeah, and I think the, as we look at our fleet mid this year, it'll be 24 joules or 24 watts per terahash as the average across our fleet. So one of the most energy efficient fleets uh, in the industry. But I think, um, to Matthew's point, when you look at the, the M&A opportunities, can be about buying infrastructure, not buying mining equipment. It's buying power infrastructure because um, as we come into the halving, you know, if the Bitcoin price, price of Bitcoin isn't somewhere near $50,000 come April of next year, uh, essentially, there are going to be a lot of miners that are going to be stressing out. They can't raise capital in this environment today. Um, they're not going to be able to replace the old rigs they have with new energy efficient rigs. And, uh, you know, the, a number of prognosticators now are projecting that the global hash rate will actually drop at the halving mm. because there's so much inefficient equipment still in use and it, the capital environment is such that you can't raise debt or equity unless you're one of the largest miners um, to replace your fleet. So it's going to be a very challenging situation, I think. Do you think the biggest problem this time around was that a lot of companies were over leveraged? They bought uh, gear at prices that were way too high because it was a bull market? Or are there other dynamics at play that kind of brought us to where we are today? You know, this is a business where, from when you say, go, I want to grow, it can take anywhere from six months at the most optimistic to more likely 12 months. Mm -hmm. And so people are making decisions when the number is going up and they're thinking, you know, I have to mine more now, I have to grow now, so I place orders, you do things. Because when the price is going up like it was in 2021, you know, people just, it was uh, uh, just a frantic growth race. And if you placed orders and you didn't have price protection in your orders, which basically means that when you actually pay for the equipment, if the price in the market has dropped, you get credited that drop. Um, you were in a very bad situation. And a lot of people had all the cash they had, they invested in the power infrastructure, and then they said, well, as the miners start being delivered, I'll just go borrow more money or I'll go raise money. And then when the capital markets and the debt markets dried up, they all of a sudden had this power infrastructure, but they couldn't pay for the miners they had ordered. 
And so we end up with a flood of equipment on the market at bargain basement prices. Yeah, and Cleanspark, Matt, I, I, you know, you guys raised a lot of money and then you sat on it. And then you kind of jumped in once those prices did fall, which was, you know, very good business decision, but did you feel FOMO when it was a bear market, or walk us through the decision-making process there? We had some fortuitous timing, but we, you know, we ran some pretty extensive analysis, and looking at the orders that were placed and what that would do to global hash rate, it was clear that difficulty was going to increase, and then as a, an, an energy company in our DNA, we, were, we model our energy pricing utilizing different metrics that are available and, and some of the future pricing models indicated an increase in energy cost and obviously Bitcoin is a volatile asset. So unlike oil, where the volatility is the price of a barrel of oil, we have the volatility of the energy cost, we have the difficulty, and then we have the volatility of Bitcoin. So the challenge is a lot of, a lot of miners in the space built a business model on a snapshot in time, assuming that everything is going mm -hmm. to say, stay November of 2021. And that's not realistic. So I think you have to, from our perspective, I think we look to be strategic rather than ideological. You know, we, we consider ourselves Bitcoin rationalists because, you know, while we're very bullish on the underlying commodity being Bitcoin, we understand that it's a volatile market. And, you know, to Fred's point, literally in this business, unlike anything else in the world, if you're not growing, you're absolutely dying. Last question. We've got less than a minute. Uh, what keeps you up at night right now when you think about your business and the work that you're doing? Gabriel? Well, I'd have to start by saying, I mean, the having. There's just so much uh, on top of the volatility. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty. And so a lot of what we spoke about in this panel is efficiency and how important efficiency uh, is to our business. So we are focused right now on doing everything we can to improve the efficiency uh, while also just... Um, well, for on our part, we are also working on diversification because we are a data center business at the end of the day. Uh, we have a high performance compute branch of our company and we are growing that as well. So for us, you know, as the, uh, as the having comes, uh, we're ready uh, and uh, we're ready to withstand and, and look for opportunities for those less efficient miners, look for that new infrastructure. And equipment now is 10 cents on the dollar from where it was at the highs last year. So, uh, I mean, we're all very well positioned and aware of what's coming. You know, we focus on energizing and optimizing. That's it. And then the rest we don't control. Don't control global hash rate, don't control regulatory, don't control price of Bitcoin, don't control price of energy. Control what you can. <laughs> I, yeah, I think what keeps me up at night is, is the regulatory environment. Just creating yeah. logical framework to make sure that we're all operating under the same rules. Thank you for sharing your expertise and thank you for joining us today. I hand it back to Perianne. Thank you.